Good evening, my name is Roxanne Chabot from RBC Consultants. Welcome to our webinar. This evening, the webinar will be with SkinCeuticals and we are going to be discussing what is the CE Ferulic difference, a superior science of an icon. And we're going to review clinical studies proven by scientific leaders for integrated with procedures by trusted dermatologists. Our expert panel this evening will consist of Dr. Ted Lane, who is board certified dermatologist in Texas, Dr. Mark Lupin, board certified dermatologist in British Columbia, Canada, Dr. Giuseppe Velacchi, who is professor of regenerative medicine in North Carolina, Dr. Jill Wavell, who is a board certified dermatologist in Miami, Florida, and Dr. Ji Hee Kim, who is a board certified dermatologist in South Korea. We'd like to thank our supporters, SkinCeuticals, for making this educational event possible. SkinCeuticals, as you know, is the number one medical aesthetic skincare brand in the world. The agenda this evening, we're going to uh, have a brief introduction by Dr. Lane on uh, SkinCeuticals, CE Furulic. Also, Dr. Lupin is going to talk about med versus vitamin C with competitive insights. Dr. Velaki is going to be discussing environmental aggressor overview. Dr. Weibel is going to be discussing integrated skincare with CE Furulic studies. Dr. Ji Hee Kim is going to be discussing CE Furulic with Asian skin integrated skincare studies. And then we'll have a roundtable discussion at which point we will take audience questions. Before we begin, a couple of logistic tips. If you're having issues hearing the webinar, you can listen to the presentation using your telephone. Just select phone call in the audio pane and the dial-in information will be displayed. If you're having technical issues or if you would like to submit a question to our faculty, please submit the question in the question chat pane on the right-hand side of your screen. At the end of this webinar, a survey will pop up in your browser and will be emailed to you within one to two days. We'd greatly appreciate it if you could fill in the short survey and send it back to us. And within one to two days of the webinar, a certificate of attendance will be sent to you as well as a recording of the session. Again, please submit your questions using the question chat pane on the right-hand side of the screen, and I wrote a little note there so you can see where to write in your questions. So without further ado, I will pass the floor virtually to Dr. Ted Lane. Roxanne, thank you so much. Hi, everyone from around the world. I am Ted Lane. I'm a dermatologist from uh, Austin, Texas. I uh, am the chief medical officer of a group of practices called Sonova Dermatology. I, I co-found and, and host a, a, a summit based on skincare called the Science of Skincare Summit. I also host a podcast, which I hope you all will listen to, called Skincare Confidential. I run numerous clinical trials, much like every one of the uh, speakers today uh, do. I, I can't tell you how excited I am about tonight's uh, webinar. I, I even know what everyone's about to say, and I'm excited, because you truly have world export, experts on this webinar. You've got Dr. Velaki from Italy and North Carolina, who essentially does all of the basic science that we're about to talk about. So he's the guy that is doing the experiments that we're, we all talk about. Then you've got Dr. Weibel and Dr. Lee, who are just true world integrated skincare experts. And, and at not to, to, to disregard Dr. Lupin from Canada, who has decades of experience utilizing skincare along with injectables and other cosmetic procedures. So I just, I'm so excited for tonight, but let's keep going. Let's see if I can actually advance the slide. How about that? I'm so excited. I forgot to, I forgot how to advance the slide. So I just gave you the mouse, Dr. Lane. Okay, let's try it again. Okay, so we're talking about antioxidant history, environmental aggressors as well, and how CE Ferulic helps protect against those, and a clinical approach to integrated skin care as well. So here's our first polling question. Why do you recommend CE Ferulic to your patients? Is it and you don't have to choose one, you can choose more than one. Research on the efficacy and the, the scientific proof to support its efficacy, the Duke parameters formulation, essentially supporting the formulation that we have in CE Ferulic, or, and patient satisfaction and visible results. So I'll let you just quickly choose your answer. Of course, CE Ferulic is one of the most powerful 
skincare products that we have based on all the research to support it. We're gonna go through just a bit of it. Okay, well, it looks like the majority of patients use it based on the research as well as patient satisfaction, which of course, if you can use it, if the research supports its use, but patients aren't satisfied, why would you ever use it? So that makes total sense. And then we'll go through the Duke parameters formulation to really support why uh, we are using the CE Ferulic uh, as it stands. Okay. I'm doing the three Mississippi. Okay. Now we're doing polling question number two. Incorporating ferulic acid to the vitamin C and vitamin E provided X times the skin's normal protection to solar stimulated irradiation. And I know I haven't even shown you this slide yet, but it'll be inter interesting to see what people think in terms of how much protection do you think the CE ferulic gives you compared to vitamin C alone, vitamin E alone, maybe C plus ferulic? Be interesting to see what people think because you may be surprised. And I think I just gave you a little hint there, didn't I? Ferulic acid really was one of the keys to not only stabilize it, but there you go. 36% say 8% and eight times, excuse me, and then we can see the remainder there as well. Okay, well, you kind of stole my stole my lightning there, stole my thunder, so that's okay, but I'll, I'll keep going. All right, that was polling question number two. So just click in the middle of the screen, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so without, Dr. Pinnell, there really would be no skinceuticals. He essentially invented the idea of utilizing stabilized L-ascorbic acid on the skin for protection and rejuvenation. He also formulated the, the Duke parameters as well. It was his laboratory that developed CE ferulic, and he got it to a certain point, and then Dr. Valaki took the baton from there and is really giving us much more information about this revolutionary product. He's known globally, Dr. Pinnell is, as the father of vitamin C and topical antioxidants. He revolutionized how we approach skincare as well because really he was the one that showed that we can have all of the science and the data behind the, the utility of skincare products to achieve our goals. Before Dr. Pinnell, we just didn't have a lot of research, but he really changed the game in terms of what we should expect uh, of, uh, of the research and data to support the use of our products. And he made pivotal discoveries and understanding the biology of the skin and understanding how vitamin C uh, works to, as with a cofactor to, to help produce collagen and how vitamin C and vitamin E uh, are related in the skin as well. So there's 35 years of research now on this product. He obtained the, the first vitamin C patent, Dr. Pinnell did in 1992, so that's over 30 years ago. 1997 is when we started to get just the stabilized uh, L-ascorbic acid as a serum at 10% and then at 15%. He then used the Duke parameters to support the uh, formulation that we see in 2005 and the one that is still utilized today and is the top selling product for CE Ferulic uh, for SkinCeuticals called CE Ferulic, which is why we're all here. Uh, he, sh he showed a double-blind peer-reviewed study on CE Ferulic in the JAD, in the Journal of the American Academy of Dermatology in 2008. Think about how often you've seen a skincare study in the JAD since then. Uh, then he developed Floritin CF, which is, of course, a different antioxidant along with uh, uh, versus CE Ferulic. We've got Floritin involved instead of vitamin E, Floritin CF gel. Uh, then he continued to evaluate CE Ferulic. He, Resveratrol was then uh, released in 2014 as more of a nighttime antioxidant. Uh, and then of course, our latest antioxidant is Silimarin CF, which has uh, the ability to reduce sebum production and is great for those patients who have acneic skin. So really this is the research that we're showing you as SkinCeutical is that are the true uh, pioneers of antioxidant research and continue to evolve in that field. Remember that free radicals are unstable molecule, molecules. They have an unpaired electron, and an unpaired electron is an unhappy electron. It wants a partner, and so it will steal other electrons in order to uh, get that partner, and by doing so, it causes a cascade effect 
that, that leads to uh, more and more reactive oxygen species. And unfortunately, they're just destructive. They destroy collagen, elastin, and DNA. And this is what the term oxidative stress is this, is this unrelenting chain of reaction, re reactive oxygen species being produced. Thankfully, we have antioxidants, which is what we're talking about today. So antioxidants are capable of donating an electron and therefore quenching these free radicals or reactive oxygen species. Uh, and therefore, they stop them from being free radicals and stop them from doing all the destructions that they are, are apt to do without that partnered electron. Okay, now we'll talk mainly about CE ferulic and it's how it was formulated and the environmental protection that it offers. I'm just going to show you, show you at a high level and then Dr. Valaki will go much more into the research that he's done in his lab. So first of all, the pure L-ascorbic acid, uh, we can see here, the higher the level, usually the, the better the absorption as well. We seem like at 15 to 20%, uh, we get to a, a max kind of dose response or dose absorption, and then it goes down from there. So really 15% seems optimal for this formulation. And we also know that it needs to be formulated at an acidic pH in order for it to be stable. And indeed, we have that with the CE ferulic formulation. So these are the what are called the Duke parameters, okay, where he, so, where he showed that the L-ascorbic acid is the one that gives the most vitamin C to the skin. You can have other formulations of vitamin C as are shown in that graph on the left, but they essentially have to be converted to pure L-ascorbic acid to have any biologic activity. So it makes a lot of sense to apply pure L-ascorbic acid to the skin itself, which is its biologically active form. And then we could see why the certain concentration was chosen and why it was formulated at an acidic pH as well to maintain stability. And I'm just going to jump into one of the seminal papers to support CE ferulic's use. This is monotherapy use in 50 Caucasian male and female subjects, 40 to 60 years of age. They used a gentle cleanser, uh, an, a UV defense, and emollients moisturizer as needed. But otherwise, the only active really was CE ferulic. And you could see the graph here. The innermost circle is at four weeks, then it goes to 12 weeks, then the outermost is at 20 weeks. So the longer people used this product, the better their results were. And these are all the many of the metrics of what we consider skin beauty, right? We see a reduction in wrinkles. Hyperpigmentation is probably the most um, amazing result here. We see a 40% reduction in hyperpigmentation with a sunscreen, yes, but the only active is CE ferulic monotherapy and we see a 40%, and these are expert rated results. So these are dermatologists and, and or experts who rate these results on a scale. Radiance improved, texture, firmness improved, and then elasticity, which is the ability of the skin to rebound. We see that CE ferulic, ferulic improves elasticity by 36, 37%. Uh, so, so there really is some magic with this formulation of vitamin C, vitamin E, and ferulic acid as well. And certainly those photos show the results as well. Now we have an Asian skin panel. This is 60 Chinese women. The location is in Shanghai. Again, they, were, they used CE ferulic as monotherapy. And we can see here, again, the middle circle or the, the, the middle polygon is uh, week four, then it goes to week eight, and then the red is week 12. And again, look at the fine lines by week 12, 43% improvement in fine lines. Again, this is not a retinoid. This is, this is vitamin C, vitamin E, and ferulic acid in a stabilized formulation with a low pH according to the Duke parameters. We see tactile smoothness improve, radiance improve, discoloration again, improvement in discoloration. I think we, we all believe that we need to use a product that is purely for discoloration, a lightening product or a brightening product. Well, well you, you need to understand that this product in particular can brighten. It can do so many things. It's kind of like a Swiss Army knife product, isn't it? It really has the ability to improve the skin in so many different ways. And you can see on the right the before and after. Certainly, the erythema is reduced, but you can see the pigmentation is reduced. Fine lines, pore size, I think, can be seen there. Um, so, so really impressive results. But it doesn't always take 12 weeks or four weeks to see results. The immediate clinical results that are listed there in that box 
So within 15 minutes of first application, guys, so within 15 minutes of first application, we already see an improvement in fine lines. Smoothness has improved and radiance as well. So you can see immediate improvement, which is so important for compliance, right? Our patients, especially those who are uh, looking at cosmetic procedures or, or products that they consider cosmetic, they, they want to know that it's working. And if you can show them that it's working this quickly, they are more apt to continue using it. And we know that with prolonged use, the better the results will be. And so that's that I think is really, really powerful to show those immediate clinical results. Now, this is where our polling question came from, okay? So this is the, the whole idea of synergy with the vitamin C, E, and ferulic acids. You can see how vitamin C by itself gives, you know, two to three times environmental protection, okay? Vitamin E does as well. C plus E is synergistic, but look what happens when you add the ferulic acid. You almost double what vitamin C and E can do together in terms of environmental protection. And again, that's with the 15% L-ascorbic acid, that's stabilized L-ascorbic acid with the 1% vitamin E and the 0.5% ferulic acid. Now I'm going to start showing you some of the environmental aggressor data that we have. So this on the left is the reduction in MMP1, the collagenase enzyme that, that we all hate so much. And here we see unirradiated skin as control. With irradiation, we see the increase in MMP1 upregulation. And then in the presence of CE ferulic, that's reduced by 50%. So by 62%, I should say. And remember, MMP1 collagenase is the main collagen degrading enzyme in the skin. So we want to stop that from, we want to stop its activity. And that's what we're doing here with the application of CE ferulic prior to exposure to infrared A. Then thymine dimers. We know that thymine dimers are uh, uh, produced in the, in the presence of UV exposure. As in, in addition, their accumulation can lead to skin cancer. So it's really important for us to reduce the production of thymine dimers. And we, again, see that here. In the presence of vehicle, the number of thymine dimers after UVA radiation is what, near 100? And then in the presence of CE ferulic, decreased to, to less than 40. So not only are we seeing improvement in terms of the ability to reduce collagenase, but also the ability to protect from uh, UVA radiation. I think of, of these of, of CE ferulic as, as little sunscreens for the cells, right? We think of the external sunscreen that we that we use, we have our patients use, which of course either physical or or, or, uh, or not physical, uh, and then we've got CE ferulic, which acts in addition to the sunscreen to provide even more protection against UVA radiation. So this just shows you all of the scientific research that started early, you know, 1987 with ascorbic acid. And then look where we are in 2023-24. These are papers that have been uh, submitted but not yet uh, published. And there's one, Dr. Weibel's paper there um, in, about silymarin alongside a laser. See for really chelation studies by Dr. Uh, Velaki. And then we see diesel exhaust. We see it all. So really, the publications have not come to a stop. We are continuing because we are continuing to show how the exposome, the presence of UV radiation, ozone exhaust, metals, climate, all of that can lead to skin aging. And it's important to protect from skin health for skin health as well. And all of that data is either already published or forthcoming. Okay. It is my pleasure now to introduce Mark Lupin, who will now take the baton and talk further about the antioxidant protection and its protection against atmospheric aggressors. Dr. Lupin, thank you. Thank you, Ted. Uh, uh, Dr. Lane, that was a fantastic uh, presentation. I'm a dermatologist in Victoria, British Columbia, 30 years in practice. And, you know, my first connection uh, to, to uh, Dr. Pennell was when he approached me to talk about infrared radiation because he was concerned that sunscreens we know do not protect against that and had me give a talk as a dermatology resident. And I guess the rest is history because I've been really enthusiastic to, to make sure that we have the best treatments for our patients. So what I'm going to talk about is uh, more about how do we measure or know the difference uh, between products and do we know that a product will actually perform? Next slide. So we have polling question number three. 
And this is uh, true or false. All antioxidants have the same impact on UV induced erythema, which is what we also measure as minimal erythema dose. Obviously only one, uh, one answer is to be chosen, true or false. And we can wait a little bit, uh, but you can guess from the subject of my talk uh, that one of these answers may be more valid than the other. So we'll give it a little bit more time. But you know, it's uh, from, certainly from a patient perspective, uh, when you pick up a product or same with a physician, there's so many different vitamin Cs, how do we know they actually uh, are performing? Well, thank goodness uh, we got 94% false and 6% true. So I would like to speak to those uh, those people that uh, uh, chose true to, to understand, you know, do they really think they're all, this, all the same? Um, so let's present some data and uh, see how we go. So I was involved in a, in, a, in a study, at least reporting the results of a study that was looking at uh, how do we how do we know when the when a product is actually delivering what it says it is delivering, especially with antioxidant protection? Now, CE ferulic was already established uh, by the time this study occurred about a decade ago as sort of the gold standard. And what's particularly nice is it has the vitamin E, which is lipophilic, so protecting the membranes, and the vitamin C hydrophilic, so protecting the cytosol and the, the water content, and they and then they also restore each other. So we had a gold standard. We had a product that's already been proven uh, to have at least eight times protection uh, against erythema when using solar simulator induced redness, meaning MED. And it had all, all, all already been shown to help protect against induction of uh, thymine dimers, as you saw, but also sunburn cells, which happen when there's too much light affecting the uh, keratinocytes in the epidermis. So the first slide, you know, the nice thing about my bit of the presentation is you don't have to read too much. We can look at pictures. Um, so the first slide is to show that in this particular uh, uh, experiment, which is basically 23 subjects, we could show that uh, certainly between 1 MED to 5 MED, it seemed like around 3 MED was where we saw most of the, the difference. and. Uh, so you will see that we've compared six different products six that are over the counter, uh, five of them different from CE Ferulic, and basically looked at three times MED because it seemed that greater than three times MED is sort of a saturated effect. There were 23 subjects. Um, we can go to the next slide because I can go through that. And they were a mixture of uh, male and female, more female than male. And they were randomized to have um, either what we call cell one, that is patches of uh, the skin treated with uh, four of the products, and or cell two, which is patches on the skin of three different products. And the reason for these two different cells or basically two different uh, groups of patients was because of the amount of skin required to do the testing was more than the number of samples that it could contain. So I don't know if that makes sense but that's why we had to randomize to, to two different patient populations. And mostly there were Fitzpatrick two and three, so it would certainly be nice to have all Fitzpatrick types in the future. And, um, and, and then we can move to the next diagram, uh, next slide. And essentially, uh, this is the, the, the formulations, at least what they contained. Uh, the CE Ferulic is number one. And then AOX two, three, four, five, and six. Now, the two, three, four uh, were from basically Asia, and five and six were North America. Uh, and they're they're very well recognized brands. And even at this time, I had patients coming and bringing in these other brands. And you know, are they really as effective? So uh, one thing you can see common to all of them is they all have vitamin C in some form. Let's go to the next slide. Now, the thing is that uh, a proxy for for clinical evaluation of antioxidants, we thought would be MED, that's the minimal erythema dose induced by sol solar simulation, which is a combination of UVB and UVA light, and also to do calorimetric um, 
analysis of the digital photographs, which is basically a way of giving an analog number to the degree of redness. And so we thought with this combination of the two uh, methods, we, we have now at least a clinical proxy for effectiveness. Um, and, uh, and that's what was applied to this particular study. So here we have the untreated skin uh, with just the solar simulation light, then CE frulic, you, you can see in that second uh, group of slides, it's all pretty clear, so it's able to inhibit the erythema. And two, three, and four, the, these three products, basically not much different and statistically not different than untreated. So somewhat shockingly and almost surprisingly, there was, uh, you would think there would be some improvement, but actually it was uh, virtually no, no difference. And let's go to the next slide. And so this is uh, the, what's called A-star um, analysis. This is the calorimetric uh, uh, production of like how much redness can we, can we give it a numeric grade. And so this is exactly what you saw in the clinical uh, photos, but showing it in an analog fashion that the C-frulic was sort of miles, miles ahead for photo protection and the other three products, which were well known in the, clin in the market, so, really did not perform uh, uh, very well at all, although obviously a little bit better than the untreated, which was the baseline. Next study. And this is uh, to continue. Um, the lower two products, AOX 5 and 6, are, were North American products, also extremely well-known brands. And interestingly, um, AOX 5, I believe, had a little bit of sunscreen in it, so that you would think that it should protect uh, better than uh, antioxidants alone. Um, but again, C frulic was, was, was uh, fantastic protection at the three times MED and the five and six products uh, really did not perform anywhere close to the effect of C frulic. Next slide, please. And again, just to show in an analog form, so you can see that we have C. frulic obviously performing very well, and uh, AOX5 I mentioned had a little bit of sunscreen in it, so that's probably why it's a little more effective than, than six. But again, statistically, um, all, all five of these other products were not performing even close to what uh, C. E. frulic. Now, the idea wasn't to show that C. frulic actually was was better. It would be nice to show that they were all the same, or one might be better than another, but uh, it shows you that the Duke parameters, the formulation, the care that was put into the C. frulic did um, remain as a gold standard uh, product. Next slide. So that was about 10 years ago. Now, if you go about 20 years ago, this was a uh, a letter uh, written by a few people, including Dr. Pennell, and he was thinking, well, why don't we compare it, to, you know, instead of just comparing C. frulic to other vitamin Cs, why don't we compare it to uh, either benone uh, or some other antioxidants and uh, different strengths, different formulations. And this was showing up to five times MED that C. frulic was performing particularly well, and the idabenone, for instance, which is a, considered a very good antioxidant. It was originally developed as a synthetic form of ubiquinone, also known as coenzyme Q10 for dementia, uh, interestingly enough, uh, but it didn't perform even close to the, to the degree of C. ferulic. Now, this was not a human study. This was in pig skin, um, so maybe that's one reason you see some difference in, in the uh, MED. Um, but again, there was just no uh, comparison to CE ferulic. Next slide, please. So, uh, in summary, we felt that, you know, and I think this needs more work and a lot of discussion, um, there's really a great need, even now, even a decade later, uh, we have nothing on the bottles uh, uh, or even for clinicians to sort of uh, differentiate. So, what I do when I speak to patients is I say you need at least a photo-tested antioxidant, and that really narrows down the market significantly. Um, and so we felt that MED is a, is a method to evaluate the efficacy. And I would say, and we felt that three times MED, which actually now with, with uh, 
the NMED testing in general, there's a tendency to not want to use higher MEDs in any case for safety reasons, um, but complemented with the two-step methodology, the second step meaning um, to use the calor calorimetric analysis of the MED um, would be a reasonable way to, to uh, measure efficacy or at least know that a product is delivering. Um, now, the second is uh, relate to the poll question, which not all topical antiox antioxidants are equally effective uh, for photo protection uh, and see freely perform better than uh, all of those others, at least uh, at that time. Um, and the conclusion would be, you know, we need something at least that and uh, maybe consider biomarkers uh, to complement MED testing. Um, maybe could be done with tape stripping or other variety of sort of non-invasive ways to, to measure, which is a fantastic segue to my introducing of Dr. Giuseppe Vilecki, Vilecki who's, you know, if, we, if Dr. Pinell is the father of vitamin C, I, Dr. Vilecki for me is the godfather of research and uh, carrying the torch further. So with uh, no further ado, uh, here's Dr. Vilecki. Thanks so much, Mark, and thanks for showing your data that really uh, set up my presentation in a perfect way. And uh, so I think now we uh, can uh, go to uh, I have a mouse. So just to introduce myself, I'm Giuseppe Valacchi. I'm a David Murdoch Distinguished Professor at NC State. I study regenerative medicine, but my passion is uh, uh, free radicals. And indeed, I am actually the president-elect of the European Society of Free Radical Research. And of course, as you can see here, I'm also a professor of physiology in Italy, as I am a physiologist by training. So uh what uh, before we go to this to, the, to my talk let's go to the first uh, uh, to the next uh, uh, pool question but which is uh, relevant to my presentation is uh, which environmental aggressor are the most relevant to you so what do you think if you go outside in a polluted day or in an urban city uh, is going to affect more your skin is uh, our metals that, as you know, is pres are present in, uh, in the particles, is in general the, all the gas pollution, the air pollution, or sunlight is stronger. What about ozone, the tropospheric ozone, of course, we mean. So the one that uh, is a consequence of a reaction between the car exhaust and the UV light. So which one do you think uh, you should avoid? Or which one you think that maybe it doesn't really hurt me too much, even if I stay uh, more hours under these uh, uh, aggressors. Remember that uh, we really can have only one aggressor. And I can see that is kind of spread and we make sense. Of course, you there is 85% for sunlight. You for sure have been somehow uh, influenced by the previous talk, I'm, I'm just kidding. 75% uh, is in general air pollution. Some instead went more in detail. We have around between 30 and 45% uh, ozone, uh, diesel exhaust, uh, and you know exhaust in general and metals. So let's see how I can uh, link to this uh, to these results. So I'm going to take again the mouse. And uh, I think I have it. Yes. So why are we interested in skin? We are interested in skin and that I like to remind uh, this slide every time when I talk, because as I mentioned to you, I, uh, I am a physiologist. You know, the skin is actually our protection against the environment. But the fact that it's a protection doesn't mean that it is impenetrable. And indeed, what the skin does, it prevents that uh, pathogen or other insults get into our system. So that is a very important uh, function that the skin has. And so we try to always understand uh, how we can avoid the damage to the skin. And this brings to a new concept that are relatively new because are almost five, six years that came out. You know, this, the idea of the skin exposome. In, 19, in I mean, in 2005, more or less, there was the first concept of uh, exposome in general that is still a debate. But uh, 
what came out after that was the skin exposome. And what does it mean? It means that the skin aging is affected by different factors. All these factors, independently of the genes that your mother and your father lovely gave to you, it, it depends on what kind of life you have and how you will affect for sure your uh, appearance uh, in the skin. And among those factors that you can see here, and this looks like a, a, a round flower, uh, of course, there is a pollution, sun radiation, even tobacco, uh, user that has an effect. If you want, you can all group them in the concept of uh, outdoor stressors because it's very hard to avoid one or the other. So if we talk about outdoor stressors, how do they work? So what I, I, I'm not a clinician. What I'm trying to understand is the mechanism of things because if you know the mechanism, you know how how something can be blocked and you can improve even that, uh, that effect. So you can see in this slide that it's mainly divided in, in two parts in the sense we know that when pollutants interact with the skin, there is a, a, an effect that uh, can be summarized as a free radical reaction. They induce oxidative stress. And you can see this in, in the bottom red label. But on the other hand, and we all know that there is no way that free radicals are alone. Free radicals like always to be with inflammatory response. And indeed, what the pollutants they do not only induce oxidative stress, but also an inflammatory reaction. This inflammatory reaction, oxidative stress, led us a few years ago to coin a new word that is oxinflammation, because this means that the two are together and actually they stimulate each other in a positive feedback that uh, <clears throat> means that that uh, even make the situation uh, more dangerous for our tissue, in this case, the skin. So said that, uh, we also know that the skin is a very strong organ. We, uh, in terms of antioxidant, we have uh, a very nice uh, enzymatic uh, uh, defense that is uh, represented by all these enzymes, the so uh, superosseodismutase, catalase, glutathione peroxidase, all these, as you can see from these reactions, are there to avoid the formation, to destroy the formation of uh, ROS, of oxidative reactive oxygen species that are very dangerous for our uh, body when they are overwhelming. On the other hand, we have also the antioxidant that derive from our diet. Vitamin E, vitamin C has been just said. But to me, how to understand uh, that they are very important. It tells you not only the fact that they are different, but also their distribution. If you look at the skin, look, if you look at it, you see that in the epidermis, there is much more content of uh, antioxidant compared to the dermis. Look how superoxidismutase is 126% uh, more in the epidermis than in the dermis. And let me say for glutathione peroxidase, but look, catalase activity is over sevenfold higher in the epidermis than in the dermis. Why that? Because the epidermis, so the, out, the superficial layer, needs a stronger antioxidant defense because it's more exposed. And who tells you that? That's you, if you look at the epidermis and you check the gradient, how these antioxidants, that there are a lot, are distributed, you look at here, they are distributed as a gradient. Means that you have less in the surface, more in the deeper part of the epidermis. What does it mean? Means that they are consumed continuously and that's why they are depleted in the upper layer. But of course, <clears throat> all these antioxidants, they do not act by themselves. That is a very important concept that is good to remind. All those antioxidants, talk to each other. That's why it's very important, and maybe you will understand why the importance of the formulation that we are talking today about the CIFA ruling. They are very important because they talk to each other. We know that vitamin C is very important to recycle the oxidized form of vitamin E, and better to make a new tocopherol able to block peroxidation and free radical formation. And of course, all the glutathione cycle, the Thiol cycle, very important for vitamin C. And let's don't forget the NADPH, that is electron donor, very important to, uh, to make again the reduct 
fa uh, uh, reductant uh, in in ingredients of this uh, crosstalk. But what happens is that if we have an overwhelming oxidative insult, like can happen if you go outside in uh, in this environment, very polluted, you have an oxidative stress. And that was also mentioned uh, recently in a Nature paper, showing that uh, in highlighting how the skin defense cannot cope with uh, pollution damage, and that can lead to premature skin aging, if not skin condition. So said that as a, as, a, as introduction, I'd like to mention that when you study skin and pollution, you really need to know what you are studying, because that will lead you also to understand if the paper, the scientific work, is acceptable or is not acceptable. Because uh, today you can read a lot of stuff, but sometimes are not really uh, reproducible or not really um, uh, uh, on top of, of the, the literature. So <clears throat> the first thing that we have is we have two variables. First of all, in which model you will study, your, you will do your experiment, and what pollutant you have. So if uh, you uh, look at uh, the model that we we have in the lab, we know we go from just a mononuclear, uh, sorry, monoculture cell, just simple cells and a fibroblast or keratinocyte. And then we can go even more complicated. We can go to 3D model, just epidermis, full thickness, up to an explant or multi-organ in chip. So all these are all the models that you have in the lab. And you need to use more than one model to understand if your approach is right. We know that the ex vivo skin model are a very good alternative to study skin. And, uh, and that has been really uh, shown by different data, but also I will convince you of this uh, with my data. And uh, if you think that the clinical studies are the best way to do skin research, unfortunately, is not true. Because uh, clinical studies have a lot of loss, uh, the history of the patients, the drop up of this patient, the fact that you cannot really know exactly what they do. And of course, uh, uh, they start all from different baseline. So if I want to summarize the last uh, two slides, I can tell you that if you want to study skin, you do not have the perfect model. You need to understand which model you have to then understand the experiments that you want to do. And, and said that, we go back to the other variables. We need to understand which pollutant we want to study. And I'm going to start with uh, one of the uh, most noxious pollutants, that is uh, um, ozone, because uh, one thing that you need to that need to mention is all those pollutants that EPA help us to group in different sick in different groups. They act differently, and acting differently, they can penetrate deeper the skin or not even penetrate. But you will see from my data that even if they do not penetrate, they can really damage the skin. So let's start with ozone. So when you go outside is a ozone level higher or just, you don't need to go outside. If you have a printer in your office, you are exposed to, um, uh, to ozone uh, constantly because printer, as you know, makes ozone. That smell that you 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 can feel. So when it reacts, ozone reacts with uh, with the skin. It does not penetrate. It cannot penetrate. But when it reacts, it gets the formation of reactive aldehydes and hydrogen peroxide. All this reaction, what does it do? It does a cascade of effect that I'm going to summarize here as a a prime from they. You have an antioxidant depletion, protein oxidation, lipid peroxidation formation. All these that happen in the stratum corneum lead to a cascade of effect that lead to a very strong inflammation response of the skin. And that uh, actually was uh, uh, proved also in, uh, in this uh, uh, retrospective study where 68,000 subjects were evaluated for issue with the skin. So these people were going to ER because they, uh, uh, they had uh, some issue in their skin, urticaria, eczema, dermatitis, it doesn't mean what was it, but they had all these issues. And what the study did, they said, okay, let's see who is coming to the ER for skin condition, and let's say the level of uh, pollution that you have 
in that day. So what I found out that there was a direct correlation, as you can see from this plot, between the level of ozone and the visit at the ER for skin condition. So there was a direct correlation, ozone-induced skin condition. That was a big study. I contributed with some colleagues in, uh, in Canada also to other studies that confirmed this, that ozone, ambient ozone can really affect the skin inflammation. So that was a very good evidence. But again, it was a retrospective study. The only thing that uh, we wanted to know if something is damaging the skin is also if we can prevent this. So how can we prevent? And so to prevent this, we start a study and I show you how we did step by step to confirm my theory that you need to use more models and you have to know what you want from your study. We did this study where at that time when I did this study, I didn't even know that I was working with C. ferulic, but in the slide is called mix one. As you can see, when we, if you expose the keratinocytes to ozone, you have an increase, as you can see here, of a four hydroxinone L, that is a peroxidation. So we have an increase of peroxidation, but look, C. ferulic, it brings it down. Then we show that, uh, not only that, but you have, this show you carbon information. So protein, protein uh, oxidation, look, you have an increase with ozone and C. ferulic bring, brings it down. So we are able to, to quench this. And what about antioxidant depletion? We were able to show that uh, we are able to prevent significantly the formation of ROS. So it means that we have, uh, we prevent antioxidant depletion. And uh, what about the, the, the cascade of inflammatory response? We show that the NF-kappa B, the red one, the red dye here, look after ozone, how it increases, and after instead the ciferulic, in this case, mix one, is really prevented. So we are able also to prevent that. But that was just in cells. We may, we, so we, as I mentioned to you, we have to also up, approach of the, uh, the question with different models. So we went in 3D model, we went uh, in uh, um, reconstitutive human epidermis. And again, here we show that with ozone, you have an increase, and we add even serum to make it more similar to human skin. With ozone, you have an increase of peroxidation and uh, with uh, mix one, that is a ciferulic, you prevent that. But you don't prevent only that, you prevent also the ROS formation, so oxidative damage, uh, by uh, applying uh, uh, ferulic And look at here, even inflammation, but in this case is the green dye, that is NF-kappa B, that is a transcription factor for uh, pro-inflammatory genes. Look at how you have with mix one, that is a ferulic it goes back to black, even better than the control when you use it. So you really prevent that. So these uh, were just to study to show that uh, the, the model used worked, but what we, we want to do a step Father, and we want to study in humans. So we uh, had 15 subjects, we exposed the um, forearm uh, to ozone, we took biopsies, and we measure markers that are related to the ox inflammatory response. And in, also in this case, AOX, AOX1 is a ciferulic. You can see how we are able to prevent peroxidation significantly. Not only that, we are able to prevent and not only peroxidation, but also inflammation. Look, it goes up with ozone, it goes down. Here we are in humans. These are skin biopsy from forearm exposed to ozone that you can find in cities where you live. Okay, we are able to prevent that. Not only that, we are able to prevent also the bad guy that uh, um, Dr. Liam just mentioned, the MMPs. And look here, there is MMP9 that is uh, again, uh, prevent the activation of MMP9, the red dye, when you uh, treat it with uh, C. ferulic. So these data really clearly show to you that we are uh, able to prevent that. The problem that ozone is not the only pollutant to which we are exposed, and so one is the diesel exhaust, as you know. And what makes diesel exhaust very noxious is actually what uh, is uh, on the top of them, that is metal and the toxic compounds. So um, what uh, if they go into the skin, we still don't know, but what I can tell you is that uh, uh, in a barrier, when the barrier is this, there is a dysfunction, they can go through. Other people think that maybe they can go through the hair follicle. Other people think that they don't go through, but uh, they, this group shows that they can be absorbed, at least the lipophilic part of the particle. What we know from this study, that if you live in an urban area, you have an increase of hyperpigmentation. And that was the first study, the more studies, as you can see here, have been showing that. So we know that they 
penetrate, don't penetrate, whatever it happens, they really damage the skin. So let me just go to the research that we did. So we want to, we have a diesel engine and we expose an explant to diesel engine and we pretreat it with, with C. ferulic. What, what, look what we found. We found because we want to understand where it acts. So why it prevents? So diesel exhaust increase again per oxidation, as you can see the red dye, and look at how after already one day of exposure, day one, you have a, you prevent the peroxidation. So see if ferulic present, prevent the formation of peroxidation, the main mediator of uh, skin damage. But not only that, we know that uh, one of the most important thing that we have in our skin is collagen. See, ferulic, you can see that diesel exhaust really put down the collagen, especially after four days. See, ferulic prevent this damage. That is a very important because this is a, da is a damage of classic uh, premature skin aging. Not only that, we checked also elastin, and also the data on elastin were really, really surprising. Look, after four days, you are able to prevent almost all the damage that diesel exhaust does to your elastin. So you actually, even induce, as you can see here from this data, new elastin stimulation. Not only that, but we were able to show because if, the, if the, our skin is really tight and nothing can go through, it's much healthier. And diesel exhaust, in fact, is able to affect the barrier. You can see that the green line is almost lost of the loricrine, but with the ciferulic, you are able at least at one day to, to re reverse that not only loricrine, but also other important proteins that are part of the skin mechanic resilience like desmocolin, we are able to, re to prevent this damage by diesel exhaust a one day four. Not only that, but as you know, there are many other proteins such as filagrin. Look, filagrin with diesel exhaust, the green is almost lost completely after four days, and you are able to have a back with a ciferulic. So that is really important because you prevent the susceptibility of, the, of your skin to damage. And finally, the clouding one as well, another time juncture, very important, you are able to bring it up with a ciferulic, then instead your pollutants is going to uh, destroy. But not only this, but also we are able to show that uh, um, ciferulic was able to prevent uh, a melanin uh, darkening, as you can see here, but and erythema formation. So, all these data tell you that really work, but we went to the next level. So we want to do UV plus particulate in humans. And in this little glass box is where all the pollutants are going. And what we do after that, we know we took a biopsy of these patients in the back and we measure. And we just to show you that particulate matter was full of metals. And so that to confirm that that is the damage of a particulate matter that we saw earlier. And look what we found again here, UV and PM put down Filagrin and involucrin and uh, ciferulic is able to bring it up significantly. Again, we are in human subject. Here in skin biopsies from humans exposed to pollutants. And again, you have an increase of peroxidation and it goes down and increase of ferritin. You know that ferritin is a regulator when more iron, free iron is there and free iron is damaging the skin. So we actually were able to bring it back to the homeostatic level. Not only that, but the last, I think, two slides are showing that the AJAS receptor, that is, as you know, recognized cyanobiotic compounds, was induced, and we are able to prevent this. And indeed, also COX-2, that is inflammatory mediator, was also prevented to be upregulated, together with MMP9 again, and collagen as well. So all brings you to the fact that really works, but just to remind you that we are, cannot choose the pollutant of the day. We are exposed to different pollutant. We did study with ozone and UV and also with ozone, UV and diesel. And I show just one data for each study. One was, is this UV and ozone are able to have additive effect, as you can see. Look how you lose the red of filigree here. And, uh, and then if you have UV, diesel, and ozone, look at filigree, red, nice red here, you lose the more pollutants you have, by here you treat it with ciferulic and it goes back. You are able to prevent the loss of that. So we are at the end of my talk. But uh, one thing if you use a ciferulic, all of us ask is, why sometimes I live on my shelf, is a nice yellow when I buy, and then it becomes very dark. So uh, it's something that it happens like this. So we. You wonder, does it really work still at this stage? 
And so we did this study. And that uh, this study was uh, where we took a cipherulic and we exposed skin explant to UV light 100 or 200 millijoule, and we checked the cipherulic at zero months, six months, 12 months, three years. Look, UV uh, induce, uh, of course, peroxidation, but cipherulic, independently of how old, old it is, it prevents the damage. So you don't need to worry if it is a little bit darker, it will still work. So I finish here. Hopefully you were able to follow and I kept your attention to the end. Same with conclusion. Topical antioxidant application can prevent pollution damage. Ciferulic does not degrade elastin and demonstrate improvement, actually stimulate elastin and, uh, uh, and, and prevent damage of the DNA. Ciferulic was found to maintain stability for three years. And you know also because we couldn't find an older than four, than three years, otherwise we would test that as well. And of course, you have to have a guideline to test uh, your uh, compounds in good model of the skin because all, not all studies can be really reproducible. That is the most important slide because what I show, I didn't do anything. Uh, people that work in my lab did it between the North Carolina lab and the University of Ferrara. Thanks to the sponsor, thanks to your attention and uh, I am really, really happy to introduce the next speaker that she's a guru of integrated skin care. She's fantastic, super young, and we will hear about her for many decades. So please, it's nice to have to pass the baton to Dr. Weibel and uh, enjoy her talk. Thank you, Dr. Vilecki. And you are the godfather, and it's Hard to follow you, but amazing research. So hello, ladies and gentlemen from around the world. It is an honor to be with you and with the faculty of my friends this evening. Um, I would like to take you from the lab into the clinic with some more exciting data from C. Ferulic. We I use it every day and on all my patients. So I'm going to be discussing integrated skincare clinic approach. I'm a board certified dermatologist in Miami, Florida. I have 75 lasers and that's what I spend most of my day. So the first polling question, we'll go back. Okay, we'll move forward to the, this polling question. Huh, sorry, Mississippi. I'll just bring it back. There we okay, go, polling question you. number five. Hmm. There we go. So what procedures do you most often pair CE Frulic with? Please select one, lasers, chemical peels, energy-based devices, or microneedling. All right, we'll see if we get the answer. Okay, so you can see across the board that people use it with all of the above. In this panel, the lasers are about 47%, which is great because that's what I'm going to talk about. But you also see strong work with microneedling. Okay, so the next polling question, everybody get your get ready, is what are the benefits of pairing C. ferulic with a laser treatment? Please select all that apply so you can have multiple answers. Is it reduced downtime, increased formula uptake, treatment maintenance, or improved skin aging markers? Again, you can select all that apply. And the answer is, oh, wow, this is exciting. So really cut across the board. So all of them actually scored over 50%. So reducing downtime, increased formula uptake, treatment maintenance, and improving markers. And you all are actually correct. All right, so I'm gonna move into my lecture and I'm gonna be talking about in your clinic, using it on patients. And the burning question is, can you 
you see Frulic immediately post-operative with non-ablative and ablative fractional lasers to actually improve the outcome. And so I'm going to review with you three clinical trials. So this slide just really looks at intact skin and then versus the laser. So in the right upper photo, what we see is intact skin. And when we apply a molecule and a topical, you can see based on the vehicle um, that pharmaceutical companies have, have worked to develop, you can get delivery into the epidermis, but it really doesn't go deeper than that. Now, the second uh, cartoon of skin shows traditional ablative resurfacing where we remove the epidermis and you can deliver the molecules into that papillary dermis um, a little bit deeper. But now look at the bottom, which is the larger picture. This is a fractional laser of the skin. And with the fractional lasers, they're tunable. We can go as deep as we want to. And here you can see, this is the, the advent of laser-assisted topical delivery. We make these channels that stay open for about 48 to 72 hours. And then you can put topicals that have been studied and are safe down these channels. And you can see it's reaching down into not only the papillary dermis, but the reticular dermis. And that's where a lot of the action can occur. So Dr. Pinnell, who Dr. Lanes told us so much about, really had a vision for integrated skin care. And he said, if you protect your skin with antioxidants every day, you can provide protection that keeps changes that you have already corrected with an aesthetic doctor from coming back and protect your investment. And what I tell patients every day in my clinic is, you're gonna get perfect skin from great procedures and great skin care paired together like a fine wine and cheese. And I personally use vitamin C for like every day based on all this science. And I give it to almost every single patient in my clinic because of all the work of all the faculty you've heard tonight. So the first study I'm gonna share with you was done by Erica Elford. And she wanted to look at, could you increase skin permeability of topical antioxidant with the 1927 nanometer thulium laser? So she took an ex vivo study and wanted to um, use different density. So she used 5%, 7.5%, and 10% density, and then looked at the uptake of dye in freshly excised ex vivo tissue using HPLC. And what she found was pretty exciting. So let's start with the chart on the left. The um, x-axis is in time for about 24 hours, and um, the y-axis is the cumulative permeation. And so at 5%, there was an eight times normal uptake of the antioxidant. At 7.5%, there was a 12 times normal update. And as you increase the density to 10%, there was 17 times increase in uptake at 24 hours. Now, if you look at these pictures, they're beautiful. Um, the upper one shows the control. That, that matrix of that skin is pretty tight, but look what the laser creates a door that the um, C. ferula can go right through. And then the bottom picture I think is even more mind blowing. This is using a dye um, with the antioxidant. And you can see with the intact stratum corneum, nothing's getting through. And look at the laser plus dye, I think it's like 200% increase. So that proved to us that in fact, in ex vivo skin, we were getting increased permeation. So next, um, Erica took it to humans. And here her study looked at photo age skin using fractional non-ablative laser with topical antioxidants. And so this was a 12 week study with the thulium non-ablative laser at five millijoules and five to 10% treatment. And 18 of the subjects got it treatment on the forearm, whereas 40 got it on the face, six treatments of the face. The reason we did forearm or she included forearm was so she could do histology two weeks out from laser treatment. And then the facial uh, patients were evaluated one week, one month, and three months after the final laser. And what we saw, this is a picture of the forearm 24 hours after one treatment, and you can see with laser alone, it's pretty red, and it has the little MENDs, the little speckles we see, but look at the laser plus the C ferulic, significant reduction in erythema. You can see the men's are already starting to exfoliate, and that's just at one day. Uh, so then 
let's look at more data. This, I think, is one of the most exciting parts of this experiment. When you look on the left, this is the histology from the forearm. At two weeks on the left is the laser only, and you can see um, that there's repair around day uh, 14. Look at the difference of day one to the right, where we also have the, the antioxidant C. ferulic. There is much more hyperpigmentation removal, which we now know we can expect based on Dr. Velaki's talk and um, Dr. Lane's, we're getting more pigment out and you can see in that middle graph, all those little pigment is, is coming out. And even out to day 14, whereas the laser only is already healed, we're still seeing turnover of that epidermal pigment. And then lastly, the patient self-assessed different parameters based, um, and they were blinded if they were laser only or C. ferulic, they had a, a, a placebo. And if you look across the parameters, they looked at fine lines, skin texture, dyschromia, skin radiancy, skin firmness and elasticity, and overall appearance. The blue is the laser plus the C. ferulic, and the gray is the laser alone across the board in every category, including three that were statistically significant the laser plus the C. ferulic performed better. So if all the science didn't make you use this with every patient, now you know that by using it with laser, this is going to improve your outcome, not just help with your post-operative downtime, but actually improve the outcome the patient's having. Um, next, and here's a photo of, of one patient uh, in uh, that study that has pretty severe melasma, and that's with the C. ferulic and one month post laser. Next, I'm going to review uh, the study that we were honored to do at our site. And so we had treated the, we had seen what happened in the non ablative laser. So we were going to take this to the ablative fractional CO2 laser. And so we wanted to see. How did it affect postoperative downtime, swelling, redness, and look at some molecular markers? So this was a 12-week and it was a split phase study. So the patients got a complete, um, pretty aggressive laser resurfacing with the uh, fractional CO2 laser. And then they were randomized, one side of the face um, for C. ferulic and one side had control. Uh, it was double blinded to both um, the investigators, the graders, as well as the patients. And then th that was used seven days. On day five, we had five patients and we did face biopsies. We had also done a baseline biopsy. So, and then we also looked at photos day one through seven. My poor staff had to come in even on the weekends and I did too, to take photographs. The patients reported outcomes, and then I called my good friend David Ozog, and we looked at molecular evaluations of the biomarkers. So the first thing we can show you, and this was pretty much across the board with all the patients, is when you look at the photograph, you can see the on the screen, the right side, the laser plus the C. ferulic, um, this is day four post-op, is healing much better than the laser plus vehicle side. But the most exciting part of this entire um, clinical trial was when we look at the molecular results, we saw with the chart that when we had the uh, laser plus the C. ferulic, we had a um, increase in beta fibroglass growth factor with the C. ferulic. Now, this was really stunning because Dr. Ozog's group had looked at laser only in the different markers, and they had never seen basic fibroglass growth factor elevated. And this is statistically significant elevated. You can see at both five days and three months, that is elevated. And why is that important? Because FGF is a growth factor that has effects on regeneration of tissue. It affects cell proliferation, it promotes fibroblasts, which makes collagen. So this, again, is really robust science to show not only are we seeing increased post-op recovery, but also we have a growth factor that is sustained over three months only on the side with C. ferulic. So very exciting science. And then a, a colleague, uh, Dr. Hadley Johnson, uh, did a retrospective analysis looking uh, at a very similar study to what we did, which is always great to have co colleagues collaborate. And her question was really, 
is looking at the safety profile of a laser-assisted drug delivery of vitamin C ferulic following ablative fractional laser. And she had 33 patients. And the results of her analysis was that the study did not identify any side effects related to post-procedural fractal CO2 ablative laser plus the C ferulic. And all the side effects were um, minor, attributed really to the procedure, and they all resolved without complication. So with that, I think uh, we have great evidence to show you. I keep this on the back bar of my uh, laser rooms. You should use this immediately postoperatively to enhance the effect and have patients use it from the day you treat them and forever. So with that, it is my honor to introduce our next speaker this evening, who's going to continue the journey in the clinic. Uh, using the integrated skin care approach. And I'm going to introduce Dr. Kim, who's got her MD and her PhD, and she comes to us as a dermatologist from South Korea. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Weibel. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Jihee Kim, and I've been focusing on skin aging and laser treatment as, in, as a cosmetic dermatologist in Korea. And following the very insightful presentation by Dr. Weibel, who's been a pioneer in integrated skincare, I am excited to continue our explorations. And in my talk, my focus will be on the practical applications of integrated post-procedural skincare in Korean patients. Okay, so... I'll share some studies on skin pigmentations and skin aging. And the first part will be the retrospective one that I've done for the patients who underwent Q-switch NDR treatment for facial pigmentation. This was a retrospective study, including about 38 patients who had either melasma or lentigens. And all the patients underwent the same laser treatment performed by me, which was a low fluence Q-switch NDR laser. And half of them were treated with a post-laser immediate application of C-ferulic, and another half were they just stick into their regular skincare routines. And the clinical assessment was done by the photographic assessment after three sessions of treatment. On the right side, you could see the patient demographics, with most patients being females in their 50s. Okay, so now you can see some representative photographs of the patients included in the study. And the C ferulic applied group is on the left side. And in the clinical photograph taken after three sessions of Q switch in the laser, the C ferulic applied patients show further decrease in pigmentation. And to now analyze these patients, We've done scorings with clinical gradings for melasma, which is massy, like easy and passy for eczema and psoriasis. And here, the group who's been treated with C. ferulic shows statistically significant decrease in the clinical scorings of melasma. And from this study, I could conclude that the C. ferulic could be beneficial as a post-procedural skincare routine with a regular Q-switch and laser treatment. And then next, we have designed a prospective split phase study in the very short term to see whether there could be some beneficial effect of CFRLIC after Q switch in the gap for the patients who have melasma with or without lentigens. The study was done just before COVID, and it was a very short term study to assess the immediate effect of CFRLIC. So what we've done is we allocated half phase with C ferulic application twice daily, and another side of the same patients didn't use the C ferulic; they just used their regular moisturizers. And for this study, the clinical assessment was done by modified melasma scoring and also global assessment scoring, and also we've did some quantitative measurement for the pigmentation and erythema. In the study, there were 18 number of 18 patients were included, and the mean age was 40. And as you can see from the clinical photographs, uh, Roxanne, could you go back?
Okay, thank you very much. So from the upper part of the patient is the side treated with a fever leg and the lower part of the clinical photos are the part untreated with a fever leg. And as you can see, even this was the same patient, the degree of pigmentation is further lightened on the CFR like applied site, which is on the upper part. And also, I've taken the UV photography to assess the remnant pigmentation on the patients. And also, in the UV photography, there were further decreasing pigmentations. And I guess the next patient will have some melasma and lentigens as a combination. And we'll wait for the lag a little bit. So just click, yeah, you got it. Okay. Okay, so this patient also had, she had less severe melasma, but there were some significant lentigens on her face. But after applying c like after Q-switch and the app, there were further decrease in both pigmentation and also the background pigmentation on her face. And to quantitatively measure the clinical difference, we measured the melanin index with a device called Mexameter, and also the erythema index was also measured. And on the C fairly like applied site, there were some statistically significant decrease in melanin levels. And the interesting thing is that this study is only done for two weeks. And they've been using the C fairly like twice daily for two weeks, and which induced the clinical improvement in pigmentation, even in a very short term. And also, what was interesting was that in my patient's group, some patients has concerned that the using vitamin C products could induce some erythema. However, we measured when we measured the erythema, there weren't in there was no increase in erythema index even after regular application. So patients were very satisfied with the clinical result and they were very happy that they could use this potent vitamin C antioxidant in the long term. Sorry again, Roxanne, could you go back two slides? Thank you very much. So for the same patient group, I've done assessment in the clinical severity grading and because there, this study included only a small number of patients, the difference was not statistically significant. However, there was some reduction in the clinical gradings of melasma, and also the degree of improvement was statistically significant. So from this study, we've concluded that use of C-Frelic after Q-switch and the YAG could be very beneficial for the clinical improvement of melasma and also lentigens. And the next part I would like to share is the part with the microneedle radio frequency, because recently the radio frequency devices has been very popular for the overall skin rejuvenations, and especially the devices with microneedle fractional radio frequency. They penetrate the epidermis directly, and which could be a potent reservoir for the antioxidant delivery during the treatment. So from now on. I would like to share some patient cases who showed excellent clinical responses using combination treatment of NDF laser and fractional microneedle radio frequency. And this lady is a 49 year old female and she has a background melasma and also she has some old acne scars as well as some skin erythema. And generally when treating these patients, I would we are very concerned about the PIH and other side effects of the lasers or EBDs. So after treating her with NDF lasers and fractional microneedle radio frequency, I applied DC fairly and it was not irritating. And after three sessions, the clinical results were brilliant. So she was very happy with the reduction of erythema and her pigmentation is much improved. And there is a next patient that I would like to share with you. Oh yeah, here we go. So she's another very representative patient that I see in my clinic. 
So she also has a background in eczema and telangiectasia and some lentigens, and she's went through pathways of treatment several times. However, there are some remnant lentigens which doesn't go away. And I was a little bit afraid to treat in the beginning because these lesions have been there for many years and she's went through the conventional laser treatments for several sessions. However, in combination with NDAC laser and fractional micro radio frequency, I use the Freolic and after several sessions of treatment, the clinical results were optimal and the pigmentation, the reduction of pigmentation was, was clinically appealing. So the patient was very happy with the results. And as you can see, her redness of the skin is much more reduced even after the laser procedures. And after seeing some substantial clinical improvement, I designed a small pilot study to evaluate whether there could be underly underlying changes after microneedle RF and C-freolic applications. In this study, we recruited six patients. And what we've done was we made a split phase study. So the full phase was treated with a fractional microneedle RF. However, only half part of the face were treated with the ferrolic twice daily, and other half was treated with a regular moisturizer. And in this study, we did analysis on three days, a seven day and four weeks post-procedure. And to assess the clinical improvement, we did 3D measurement, and also I tried to measure the skin laxity by the ultrasound and also the cutometer. So the patient demographic is mostly female patients on their 40s, and if you see the results, I will show the clinical photograph of 52-year-old patients. So she went on the full face fractional microneedle radio frequency and the freolic was applied on her right side of the face. And because she went through the fractional microneedle radio frequency, the lower part is the ultrasound image and as you can see, the overall dermal density has been increased. However, there are more significant increase on the C-Ferulic applied site. And to assess the mid-phase volume, it is very difficult to directly assess the mid-phase volume. So what we did is we take a 3D photograph and instead we measure the mid-phase curvature. And on the 3D image, the mid-phase curvature after treating with the ferrolic showed slightly increased, slight, slight increase on the curvature volume, which could suggest further increase in the mid-phase volume. And there were more substantial degree of improvement on the C ferrolic applied site. And next, what I try to do is to measure the, the dermal thickness and also the degree of skin elasticity. And here we use two devices. The first one is the ultrasound, and the second one is a device called cutometer. And from the measurement of these two devices, there were further increase on the C fairly applied site in all six patients. And as you can see in the bar graph, because we did a very powerful treatment, there are sustained increase of skin laxity up to four weeks. However, there are slightly further increase on the C fairly applied site. And the last result from this study is evaluating the post procedural melanin index and post-procedural erythema index. Because we had a small number of patients, the difference between the melanin was not very significant. However, what was interesting was after performing the fractional microneedle RF, usually the post-procedural erythema could last up to three or even for one week. However, starting from the day three, the patients who had Z ferulic application the site showed further decrease in erythema, which could suggest the reduced downtime as presented in Dr. Weibel's study in the fractional CO2 laser. So after seeing these clinical results, I was a little intrigued by how this product could actually work 
to the skin cells. And this could be very similar to Dr. Velocci's work. And I did a mini in vitro study using combination of UV and particulate matter, which is another atmospheric pollutant. So to briefly introduce the study, after applying UV and particulate matter, the collagen level is significantly downregulated. However, application of C-phrylic could rescue the downregulated collagen level, which is representative by the decrease of collagen degrading enzymes and also increase of the collagen modulating factors could further, further induce increase in the skin collagen and skin collagen turnover. And as a summary, as a clinician, the application of antioxidants could serve as a vital intervention in reducing the signs of photoaging and also the atmospheric aging. And as an integrated skincare regimen, incorporating antioxidants could potentially reduce skin aging signs and also boost the outcomes of procedural treatments. And in the context of treating patients with lasers or energy-based devices, applying a very potent and clinically proven antioxidant formulation could minimize the procedural downtime and also can amplify the desired effects of the laser treatment. Uh, therefore, I, I would like to suggest that integrated skin care combining post-procedural treatment with antioxidants could be a very promising strategy in evolving the landscape of skin aging. And I think that was the last part of my talk. And here comes the last poll. Uh, what is the most interesting benefit of C. Lake to your patients? First, correction of skin damage, second, prevention of skin aging markers, and lastly, the efficacious studies on environmental protection tests. When answering the poll, please, please remember that you can select multiple answers. Okay, so during this webinar, we had some experts showing how C. Fairlick started and how the basic science works and also the background scientific data. And I agree with all of you, it could be, C. Fairlick could be very beneficial to correct the underlying skin damage with or without, without laser procedures. And also, I think it could be very beneficial for the skin aging marker prevention and also in combination with procedure, it could enhance the clinical effect as well as the clinical outcome. So thank you very much. I guess that was my part. Thank you. Well, yeah, we'd like to thank our supporters, Consuticals, for making this educational event possible. Um, if all of our panelists could come back onto their camera. And Dr. Lane, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions from the audience. Okay, thanks, Roxanne. So, what a wonderful webinar. I just, there's a few questions that are in the um, question panel, and they're really just short answers. And I, just to clarify, one question Does SkinCeuticals or L'Oreal have any plans to become cruelty free? Just, just to make sure we're all on the same page, L'Oreal does not test on animals. So, L'Oreal, all of L'Oreal's um, and L'Oreal Dermatological Beauty, all of their products are cruelty free. Um, in terms of the skincare routine in these um, trials, the patient, uh, some of the, the listeners were a little bit confused whether the CE product was applied only the day of the procedure or continued on afterwards. And this is uh, applied day of procedure and after procedure as well. Um, and then is there any difference in responses, since there's such a wide age range in the studies, is there any difference in responses between younger versus older? And there is no statistically significant difference in response between the younger versus the older patients. Um, and then uh, how long is CE for really stable after it has been opened? Um, Giuseppe, do you have any data on that or any, any insight on that? So uh, the, the, no, in the sense that what we tested was sealed okay uh, we was a three years sealed uh by on on open bottle no but we can for sure do it okay all right thank you um roxanne those are all the questions i think you know it's been chock full of great information for everybody and and uh it, it really delivered tonight don't you think 
Absolutely. Thank you so much to all of our expert panel for their enlightening presentations and also Dr. Lin for your excellent moderation. And we'd like to thank all of our audience for joining us this evening. Have a great evening or have a great day wherever you are in the world and happy holidays to everybody. Good night. Ciao, everybody. It was great honor to be Good with night. all of you. Ciao. Thank you. Wonderful. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.